Well, hello. <laughs> Welcome to a new Seeing Clearly on the road. Not that you can tell, but I am in Canada in my aunt's basement. <laughs> For those of you who are keen observers and have seen my videos before, you'll notice there's a new window there, which is not present in my studio back in New Zealand. And I am reunited with this fabulous big painting which my aunt bought. It's the cover of my Seeing Clearly book and you can see the scale of it. It's really quite a grand piece. Not quite life-size but getting close to it it's a um, meter and a half high which is five feet and what I wanted to discuss today <laughs> It's the, all of the themes that come back to me when I see this painting because it caused quite a lot of unknowing division where the meanings in the painting or my intention in the painting was misunderstood. And it really has made me think over the years, what do we do when our pure intentions, our positive intentions are completely misunderstood. Is there anything that we can do about that situation? So this painting was done in 2019 and it was the first painting I ever allowed people to see unfold. So it was an enormously positive pivot point for me where I exposed my entire practice from the blank canvas. I invited my art students to come and watch if they wanted to, to take notes, to take videos, to ask questions and through the whole process of the painting until the final tweaks I had an audience which was amazing for me. It was really helpful for the students because they saw my struggles as I worked my way through some of the technical challenges and some of the comments and feedback I had from the audience really changed the way the painting evolved. I think at one point I was trying to create a really, really smooth blended sky. It's one of the things I'm known for being able to do. And I couldn't get the look that I wanted. And a couple of people in the audience said, actually those streaks look fantastic. They're like little light clouds. And I allowed myself to create an imperfect sky based on the reaction from the people who were watching. It gave me permission to do something which I felt was a little unusual and not quite as perfectly smooth as I wanted it to be as a teacher demonstrating technique. I was allowed to let go a little bit, which was very helpful in my entire process of, of exposing my, my uh, techniques, exposing the way I painted, showing my students that I was just like them and struggled with the same issues. I just spent a lot longer working through technical elements and becoming more confident with my materials and of course I was able to pass on that knowledge as a tutor but even as a tutor I hadn't felt confident enough to let people see my mistakes as I was making them as I perceived them so that was a really like a watershed moment for me and for my students like bringing them together and giving me a completely different confidence with my work. And it started me on the path towards loosening up, relieving myself of the burden of, of negative judgment of others and allowing myself to expose the, the fragility and the difficulty of the, the creative process as an artist. It was extremely helpful. And that in itself is a, is a whole story to one side. But the painting is really a, an accumulation of the previous 10 years or so of my life in New Zealand. And it brings together all of the different themes in my paintings that I've been doing over the years. For those of you that know my work across all of the different subject matter, in the background here, so this was specifically 
done to show East Coast New Zealand where the sand is is pink or very very light light white on the west coast the sand is black so there's an obvious difference there and this is quite a specific cliff off the beach of Fitianga where I lived for five years and really developed my art practice and became started becoming an art tutor with drawing classes so I have my walking shoes on because I was known for going for my walks through Fittianga and I did a whole illustrative series called Wandering Under Big Skies, which was about me walking around, exploring different places in New Zealand and talking about my feelings of being in the new country as, a, as an immigrant. I'd only been in New Zealand for a couple of years at that stage. I did many, many paintings of the coast. So all of this really harks back to all of my beach paintings. And I did a lot of paintings of trees. I still do lots of paintings of trees. And this here, the foot up on the, the tree stump was a little bit of, a, of an environmental nod. And, and the idea of you know, the trees being, being cut down and, and humans being a little bit in control or thinking they're in control of nature, wanting to be in control of nature. But it's also me connecting into the tree, into the into the earth. Now, you'll see the pendant there is the one I still wear so that I'm well known for wearing that pendant. And I had slightly different hair at the time and different glasses, but it's very definitely me. And here I am wearing a an armoured bodice, which I just made up because in one of my alternative worlds I'm a warrior queen well of, of course I am <laughs> and, uh, and equally in the real world I definitely felt like I needed to wear armor a lot of the time to protect myself um, to try and shield my vulnerability because I was doing so much to make sure everybody else was all right in, before me and, and many of my uh, emotions were being, my negative emotions were being kept in check. So this is my, my shield. This is how I am protecting myself. But equally, it's um, the costume of a, of a, of a warrior and a, and a goddess. Some little bit of potential Greek slash Roman uh, symbolism with, with snakes coming down there. So a little bit of blending of the masculine and the feminine in there. And I wanted to have a, a skirt a little bit like the Roman gladiators would have or, or, the, or the Greek, the Greek gods. You often see them in the in the long flowing, flowing robes. But I've got cycling shorts on. So, you know, I'm not showing too much. I don't want it's not some kind of titillating image. And it's it's about regaining the power within. And this is the first self-portrait I'd ever done in which I'm standing upright, in which I actually have control and self-control and, and power. In all of my other self-portraits, I'm um, hiding, I'm, I'm afraid, or I'm angry and climbing out of, of the painting. So this is a completely different opening up of the, the chest, opening up of the heart center and saying, here I am. It was a pivotal point in my self-development journey and the next year in 2020 I started compiling in a new way the text for the book Seeing Clearly. So this was at the turning point of that where I'd actually emerged from all those years of, of challenge, the trials and tribulations, the the, the self-defeating behaviour, the internal battles, the conflict, the external conflict as well, and really allowing Charlotte to, to emerge. And the title of the painting is Yes, I Can Save You. And it's tongue in cheek because, of course, what I learned through that whole journey was that the only person we can ever really hope to save is ourselves. And yet I was being ironic because I'd spent so many years, decades, trying to save other people, thinking that that was my job. That was what I was here to do. I was given this inner joy, this energy, this confidence to help other people who were struggling. 
And yes, that has become part of my work. But now I understand that I can achieve that by lifting myself up rather than pulling myself down, which is what I did for a long time. So this was a triumphant emergence. It was a wonderful statement of joy, of confidence, of self. And I brought together all of the different elements of my of my work over the years, tying it together in the background. And this edge, which I did with fluid acrylic, a lot of water and blowing it with a straw. So really breathing life into the paint. I use that technique in a lot of my abstract paintings, a lot of my works. I still use that technique, actually, probably just started doing that within that previous year or or two. So it was quite a recent technique and it almost feels like a portal, like one of those science fiction portals where you start to see something emerging before it becomes real. It also feels a bit like a cameo necklace, you know, an oval where you just have an image in the centre. And I wanted the clear white border as, as a frame with the just the tendrils of my world starting to to sneak out into the the white blank canvas so it, it was an incredibly powerful triumphant piece and it it felt like um such a, a powerful statement of where i'd got to and yet the meaning within the painting was misunderstood by quite a few people, as I discovered later. So the context is that I put this work into a number of local exhibitions or competitions, didn't get anywhere, it wasn't accepted, that's okay. But I was a little surprised that it didn't even get into an exhibition in which it wasn't juried. So there wasn't a, a panel, it was of judges, it just, didn't get in and it took me a year or two to discover that with a slightly bigger picture perspective when I did this it was just around the time of the anniversary the 250th anniversary of Captain Cook landing on these east coast beaches and there was a really big commemoration of the event. Now the landing of Captain Cook obviously had mixed results depending on whether you feel that these explorers did the right thing and how much they affected the indigenous populations. It's a it's a story that goes all the way around the world for any kinds of indigenous peoples who have been impacted by a colonial influx. By, by this kind of, of exploring and uh, takeover. So I think, <laughs> I know, that this image was perceived as a statement of white privilege and uh, champion championing over the land, that especially in the location, that suddenly we have the warrior, the, the hero coming in, claiming the empty beach, claiming this land, cutting it off at its knees, reducing nature, destroying the, the natural environment for his their own greed and need and look at the posture look at that pride and egotism that this is this belongs to us and it didn't get into any show because i think it was going to cause i think any exhibition organiser around that time felt it was going to be too controversial for 
showing a side that they perceived, a side of the history that they perceived to be really sensitive and very much anti-Indigenous and exploring only the European um, pride and sense of destruction and winning of you know, the takeover, which it wasn't at all within my mindset. It was a complete coincidence that the anniversary of landing at this beach happened to be at the time when I painted this and entered it into a number of exhibitions. And even though I included information about the, the painting, the title, Yes, I Can Save You, accompanying this image was taken to be the colonial view of coming in and saving the natives from their own backwards ways by implementing a European way of being. And when I heard this response, and it was never direct to me, and that's another thing, when a response comes via other people, of course, it goes through the filter of other people as well, as opposed to being direct, which makes it a little bit more challenging. And you have to wonder why you're being told this through a, a third party. But also the 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 shock that I, it, I could have been perceived to be creating a painting, that I would have wanted to create a painting which was telling that story as opposed to a really personal story. In fact, quite a few of my friends and my mum at the time that I did this questioned the title and said, ooh, that sounds really, oh, you really sound egotistical and you know that's going to send the wrong message. And, and I said, no, it has to be that title. I had that title in my head from the very start. And the story is absolutely vital. The, the meaning behind the title is, is critical to understanding my journey and the journey that I know so many other people have been on, of trying to help other people and not putting themselves first and not saving themselves. And, and what good does that come? It actually doesn't do any good when we're lying in a crumpled heap on the floor. You need to save yourself first. And by doing that, you can save others because you have the energy to do it. It's why on an airplane, you're told to put your oxygen mask on first before you help somebody else, before you help a, a child or someone who needs assistance. You need to make sure that you can help them by feeding yourself the oxygen. But none of that, I didn't have a chance to explain any of that. And I know that I got tarnished, my reputation got tarnished by the misunderstanding of the themes of this painting because of the timing that it was done and all of the events that were happening in New Zealand around that time with the commemorations, which are very sensitive. So what can I do? What can you do? Nothing. <laughs> that's, but that's really, really difficult because I did feel very defensive. I felt a little bit attacked and thinking, how could somebody think that that's what I would want to paint? But you have to remember that everybody sees through their own eyes and through the backpack of experiences that they're carrying with them, through all of the challenges, the um, reactions, the experiences that they've, they've had, everything influences the way that they respond to an image. Their own context is crucial. And unless somebody understands the intended context, 
they've they are only going to impose their own ideas and there's simply nothing that you can do no matter how many times you stamp your feet and wave your arms and say I didn't mean that somebody is always going to have their own reaction and it can be very difficult to change that initial reaction but this got me thinking a little bit more widely especially coming here to visit family and my mum grew up here and if you've been following my story you will know that my mum suffered from anorexia and, and a number of different mental health issues which stem from the anorexia or that they're all wrapped up together and the family found it very difficult to understand how she was feeling the anorexia developed when she was 12 and at that time as well it was completely misunderstood in the medical world and this was in the 50s 60s and her she was very intelligent and probably would be on the spectrum if she was alive today and they have very different ways of of monitoring and understanding how different uh, brains work and the doctors at the time didn't understand that there was something wrong with her and didn't pick up on anorexia I guess it was wasn't really discussed it certainly wasn't it wasn't understood it wasn't a disease that was prevalent in the way that it, it is understood and the way it is quite prevalent now unfortunately and because of a kind of misdiagnosis and a complete misunderstanding from the medical profession my mum developed from a very early age a total distrust of doctors and nobody everyone just thought she was strange or hysterical I mean it was that old-fashioned and ignorant but they were operating in the times that they were in it was a very different system and I'm glad that the system is different now and there's a lot more information out there and a lot of people are able to talk about their experiences and I can remember my aunt saying that she'd found in one of my mum's diaries from when she was 13 or 14 a description of how she felt like she wanted to disappear and how she was hiding food and, and lying about eating and things that could have been quite helpful for doctors to understand to try and get into her head and experience her her way of thinking her way of perceiving the world but that didn't happen and equally you know I think with with hindsight would it have made a difference maybe she would have been shipped off to a psychiatrist maybe it would have been worse for her because all of a sudden she was expressing and explaining something which the medical profession wasn't prepared to take on board at that stage so even now when things have moved on quite a lot with regards to specific mental health issues it still can be incredibly difficult for us to understand and empathize how somebody else is viewing the world how somebody else is thinking and feeling because we can't ever really understand how someone else sees the world we can only try and empathize with our own with versions of our own experience and trying to imagine how that might be but still it's it's really difficult I found it quite challenging when I was a lot younger to wrap my head around mum's some of mum's fears and a, an absolute abject fear of the the heating going off because she was so thin she got so cold and when she was cold she just couldn't get warm again so she was terrified about the the heating going off and she became obsessed with the sounds of the the central heating in the boiler sort of clicking on and vroomf. she got used to hearing the the pilot light going and the, the sound of the water gurgling into the radiators and that became and she oh, she'd relax as soon as she could hear that and this became a daily obsession and something that she focused on more and more as she got older well most people would say oh my goodness just 
if the heating doesn't come on, we'll just get an engineer around to fix it or um, plug in a, a little electric heater, put a blanket on while we're working out what to do with, with the heating. But it's very difficult to understand how somebody with such a restricted sense of the world, restricted sense of being, a fear of a really critical fear of, of being left to fend for herself because she knew she couldn't cope. And the, the need to be warm was so important that that became a focus for a great deal of her anxiety and an obsession. So for all of the people, the majority, who don't have any kind of, who are lucky enough not to have that kind of obsessive focus or fear, it's really difficult to give somebody patience and kindness that maybe they deserve. Of course they deserve it. But it's difficult to know how to handle that situation. And for the person who's experiencing the fear, who's experiencing the isolation and the alienation, to be that misunderstood is really, really difficult. The sense of being people having prejudice against them, thinking the wrong thing about them, misjudging them, just not understanding where their values are. It, it leads to so many different challenging issues. And I've experienced that oh, plenty of times. But this painting summed all of that up and seeing it here again and being in the family homestead where six generations of my family have lived in this property, in this bit of land in Canada. So it has a lot of history here, a lot of energy going through the generations. And it's really made me reflect on how things have changed, but equally how they haven't, how we can still our purest intention our most personal exposing of self, the vulnerable opening of the heart can be taken as a political statement or a racial slur. It can be completely misconstrued. And I've learned that in those situations, if you have an opportunity to explain yourself, that's great in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But if you don't, being able to sit calmly, serenely with the knowledge that you're misunderstood and let it go, that really is an incredibly positive development. And I would like to invite you to think about occasions where you may have instigated a misunderstanding where you may have misunderstood someone's intentions and they've been defending themselves against what you've said. How have you reacted? And have you changed your mind when you've heard their side of the story? Have you kept your initial reaction because you haven't wanted to change your mind? Why is it that you've wanted to hang on to that first response? where you felt like maybe someone was attacking you or they were making a statement that you needed to attack, that you felt somebody was being attacked and you ran to the defence of that, that group. Because the people who decided that this painting was some kind of pro-colonial invasion um, political painting, they leapt to the defence of the people who might have been offended by it and they felt offended on their behalf and made that call. So there was a, a go-between and that's interesting in itself because maybe the people who were being defended protected from my offensive work might have seen something different in the picture. They might have seen the strength. They might have seen the inner light that I was trying to portray and not jumped to the conclusion of the people organising the exhibitions and choosing 
the work, the show, who were being overly sensitive. So it's really broad, but very interesting because we do feel defensive when we're misunderstood. And can you let it go when you know you can't change someone else's opinion? And there is all sorts of information on my website which explains about this painting in the book, whole chapter about it. But who knows whether any of the people who were offended by this work, who misunderstood it, they probably wouldn't be interested in, in reading what I wrote, what my real intention was. And I need to sit with that and know the purity that of intention that I put out, the positive story I wanted to share with people, that is what's important. You've just got to do it, put it out there and hope that it lands in a positive way for the people who need to hear the message. And if it lands on stony ground, there's nothing you can do. And you need to be strong with that, that knowledge that you can't save everybody. You can only save yourself. That's really important. And your own integrity must always stay strong. So from Canada, I will see you again in the UK as I continue roaming around with my Seeing Clearly series. Thank you so much for being there. See you soon.